I'm stalling right now because I forgot to put my bookmark in the Bible where I needed it, but I'm good now. I uh, shared a story before about uh, when I first, I, I, was, uh, I was raised in the church but kind of fell away, never really took it seriously, never really believed it, and uh, came to know Jesus in my 20s. And I fell in love with this really cute girl named Crystal, and uh, she uh, moved to Tennessee. And so I said, well, I don't have anything going on. I'm going to move to Tennessee myself. And I uh, stayed, uh, was going to church down there, was staying with a couple guys. Uh, they had a, a house there. They had a room, and I had a mattress in the room, and, and uh, was uh, searching all over the place for a job and couldn't find a job anywhere. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in I'm a little bit of trouble here. And uh, there was a great guy from the church that we were going to, his little church, and he was a tour, one of the tour managers for this Christian music artist. I'd never heard of this guy, but Carmen. I don't know if you've ever heard of Carmen. A lot of, I was very new to this. Carmen, if you don't know who Carmen is, he's like the Christian music Neil Diamond. He's like a, he's a big deal. And I said, okay, I guess I'll travel around with Carmen. And uh, I go, what do I got to do? And he said, well, you got to sell merchandise. And I said, okay, sign me up. So I uh, went on tour with Carmen, and we, he had uh, semi-trucks and, and tour buses, and we would pack out stadiums. He would pack out stadiums. I didn't have too big a deal. They weren't, not a lot of people were there for me. But uh, he would pack out these stadiums and I would sell merchandise and it was, uh, was kind of interesting that I went to Tennessee for this girl and then I'm gone. I leave on this tour around the country and I'm gone for months at a time. And uh, I learned, uh, I, I met some people there. Uh, there were Christ followers and we kind of were on this bus and we just lived together and I was learning what it meant to be a Christian. And I was telling my friends, my friends back home heard, Chad Gibbons, our friend, has become a Christian. And a lot of them were a little bit concerned about this and wondering, what is this all about? And I remember we were going up, we were traveling to Michigan. We were uh, uh, on tour in Michigan. And I called up my friends. I said, come on, you got to hang out with us. And, uh, you know, hang out with me. I got uh, some time during the day. And so some of my old friends came down, my old partying buddies. And I said, come on on this tour bus. And they said, who's this guy, Carmen? I said, I don't know, but he seems like a big deal to these Christians. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they said, so what? So you're a Christian now. And I said, yeah, guys, I am. And, uh, and they said, well, what does that mean? What does that mean, you're a Christian? And it was a, kind of a, a point blank question. I wasn't really prepared for it. And, uh, you know, I, I was a very new Christian. I didn't, I didn't, you would ask me what the gospel was. I would have said, I don't, gospel, I don't really know what that means. And so I kind of fumbled through an answer, just what I understood at the time. I said, you know, guys, what it means is I just, I admitted to God what I've known for a long time is that I'm a, I'm a sinner that I'm, I've messed up, I've made mistakes. And more importantly, I've accepted the price that God paid for me. I've accepted that Jesus uh, freed me. And so I took him up on his offer and now I wanna live a new life for him. And they said, huh, that sounds interesting. And now they knew me. I mean, they, here we partied together, we drank together. They're like, wait a second. I said, guys, it's not about that. It's just about, and it's not about me pretending I'm some great person. It's me admitting that I need help. They said, okay. He said, this, this, what does this mean to have a, to walk with Jesus, to follow Jesus? And I said, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. He said, do you, you and I remember my one friend was baffled by this. He says, you really think about Jesus every day? Do you think about Jesus every day? Now, I was on tour with Carmen, and every day Carmen's singing about Jesus. So I'm like, yeah, I, I guess I do think about Jesus every single day. But I kind of cheated because I was forced to. And they said, well, you think about Jesus every hour of every day? And I thought, no, I, I don't know if I do that. I, I don't know if I think about him every hour of every day. And they're, they're like, well, what does that mean then, that you're living a new life? And I was like, I don't know. You've got me confused. And I was, I was confused, and I was kind of stumped by it. And it, the, the question perplexed me. What is it? Am I really following Jesus? Because a lot of my life now is the same thing I was doing before. You know, I've still got to work. I've still got to eat. I, you know, a lot of this stuff is the same. So is my life really different? Do I'm really living a new life? I remember... Uh, uh, a sermon the, the pastor at that little church was giving once, and he read Colossians 3.17, and that one stumped me too. It, 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 uh, it tripped me up. Because Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything, do it all, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I remember sitting in service and going, Everything? Gosh, Everything? Am I, really, am I doing everything in the name of Jesus? I don't know if I am. 
And the next day I was eating a bowl of cereal. And uh, I can't remember what cereal it was, but I was reading the ingredients on the cereal box. Uh, this is before cell phones, you know, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing really to do except you read the cereal box. And I'm reading the ingredients on the cereal box and thinking, wait a second, I'm supposed to be doing everything for the glory of God. I go, wait, am I, am I reading the ingredients on the cereal box in the name of Jesus? And I thought, well, what am I... Am I not supposed to read the ingredients on the cereal box? What am I supposed to do? And I was tied up in knots. And I remember thinking, well, what is it? What would it even look like for a person to every single thing they did was in the name of Jesus? Would this, I, I, just, I just pictured a person who woke up, read the Bible and prayed, and then went to sleep and read the Bible and prayed. And, you know, is that all that person does? What do they, what is it? You know, that person would you'd only last a couple days if you're, not, if you're not even eating. So I said, well, maybe they eat too. So a person wakes up and they read the Bible and they, and they pray and they also eat. But do they not, what else does a person who follows Jesus in everything they do, what else does they do? Because we have to work. We have to earn the money for the food we eat. We, you know, how do, we, how do we live this life? Seems like this wild thought of every single thing we do, we have to do in the name of Jesus. And I struggled with that. There's a, there's a word that helps put this into perspective. At least it helped put into perspective for me, but it's a, it's a tough word. It's a Greek word. It's, uh, the New Testament was written in Greek, and there's a Greek word, doulos. I have a picture of what the Greek word looks like. Oh, it has the definition there. That was the, okay, so you guys know what it means. So there's this word doulos that shows up all of the time. It's used a bunch of times in the Bible about who we are uh, in relationship to God. And it, it shows up in uh, Philippians 2, the verses that in your bulletin there. I'm going to read uh, two sections from the verses in Philippians. So we're going to read verses 3 through 8 right now. And he talks about this idea of being a doulos, being a servant. He says, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships to one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So here's what he wants his follow. Here's what Paul wants Jesus' followers to do. Basically, be like Jesus. Have the same mindset of Jesus. And he says, think about Jesus. He says, Jesus, being in very nature God. Jesus, it, I mean, that's, it, it get, that's pretty clear. Jesus, who is the very form of, the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, what did Jesus do? Rather, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of of a doulos, of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I'm going to stop there for a second. This is amazing. This is amazing thought that Paul's saying. Paul's saying, um, we have a new identity now, and we aren't, as Christ followers, we aren't supposed to be living to satisfy ourselves. We aren't supposed to be living selfishly. He says, think about Jesus. Jesus was the highest of the high. He was in very nature God himself. But he didn't consider equality with God as something to lord over everybody. He didn't use that to his own advantage. What did Jesus do? Paul wants to remind us. He lowered himself He's at the highest of the high, and Jesus lowers himself to the lowest of the low. He become not only one of us, but he became obedient even to death. And not just death, Paul says, even death on a cross. So Jesus, with, with, who is very nature God, became nothing. The highest of the high to the lowest of the low. Why? Because he became a doulos. He became a servant now, this word doulos, uh, like I said, it, it means servant, but the idea of servant is not quite right because, uh, and English translations have a very tough time with this word doulos, and uh, sometimes it'll translate it a couple different ways because the, it, it, here's why it's tough, and here's, it's a little bit hard to even talk about what doulos means because the technical definition for doulos means slave. Now, 
English translations don't like to use the word slave because when we think slave, we think, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, the, the horrible atrocities that happen there. And our mind goes to, you know, uh, race, kidnapping, beating, you know, kid, you know, horrible conditions. That's what we think when we think slave. So the English Bible translators say, well, we don't want people to think slave in that sense. But really, the word, that's what the word doulos means. And so some translators will, uh, some do use the word slave. Some, a lot of them will use the word bond servant. They, they want to give this idea that we're not just, it's not like we're a servant of God in the sense that we're free to serve God or, or not really if we don't feel like it. Like, like our, our serving God is, is a job or a favor that we do to God. Because it's not that. We're not that kind of servant. Uh, and so some translations will say, well, doulos is a, is a bond servant. Uh, back in the day, the, what it meant to be a slave was a lot different than what we think it is. And honestly, what it meant to be a servant is a lot different. They were a lot closer in nature. And so um, a lot of translators will use the word servant. But the idea is very central to who we are as, as Christ followers, to who we are to God. Uh, every writer of the New Testament, well, let me put it this way. At the beginning of the book of Philippians, Paul opens up the book this way. He says, Paul and Timothy, we're the people writing this letter, Paul and Timothy do loss of Christ Jesus. We are slaves of Christ Jesus, if you understand correctly what that means. We are bond servants of Christ Jesus. That's how Philippians opens up. That's who he considers himself to be. Paul opens up Romans. Hi, this is, this is Paul, church in Rome. I am, he says, this is Paul, a doulos of Christ. I am a servant of Christ. James, another writer of the New Testament. James, and this blows my mind, was the brother of Jesus. When he wrote his letter, he starts his letter off with, James, a doulos of God and the Lord Jesus. This is who he considers himself to be. This is who Paul considers himself to be, who Timothy considers himself to be. We are servants, bond servants. We are slaves of Christ. Peter, when he wrote his book, he opens it up this way. Just look in 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. A doulos, that's the word there. In the book of Revelation, that was written by John, he says, this is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants, meaning his church, to show his doulos, what must soon take place? Jesus made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, to his doulos, John. So every, every single New Testament writer, every single Christ follower, considers themselves first and foremost to be servants of Christ. And, and it's, a, it's a more serious word than just servant, though. Remember, it's a, it's a bond servant. We, they consider themselves to be, in the wording of their day, slaves to Christ. Uh, Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, John, all, all of them. And he says about the church, we are also all servants of Jesus or bond servants. The idea is Jesus, this is the good news that we proclaim, Jesus purchased us out of bondage for himself. So, and, and that's, what, that's why they use the word slave because that's what, that's what really happened is what they're saying. That's the idea they want to get across. We are all slaves to sin. We are all slaves to, to, to our own selves and our own uh, shortcomings and failures, slaves to the enemy, slaves to the world. Jesus paid the ultimate price and purchased us for himself. And now we're not our own. Now we're his. That's the idea that they're going. So every one of them considers themselves, I'm Jesus's, basically. I'm Jesus's. This is Paul. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm Jesus's. I'm owned by Jesus now. That's the new life that they're living. Now we have a new master. And one of the things we say a lot, and maybe sometimes we don't even know what it means, but we call, we say, Jesus is Lord. We proclaim it. Jesus is Lord. And maybe we'll ask somebody, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The, the idea of Lord means someone's over you right? He's the, the, there's the Lord and the servant, right? The, we don't like to use the word slave, right? Because it gets the wrong uh, idea. But the right idea is we serve him. We're owned by him. He purchased us. This is, I mean, that's what Lord means. And it seems paradoxical because Jesus says he's offering freedom. He said, well, uh, it doesn't sound like freedom. I mean, they're all, they're calling themselves servants. They're calling themselves slaves. How's that freedom? Well, 
it seems paradoxical, but uh, freedom actually means serving Christ. Like that's, that's what freedom means. You think, well, how does that work? We were created, we were built, we find our satisfaction in serving God. That's what, that's what we're made for. That's, that's the whole reason we're here, to serve God. And so when God looked down and saw us serving other masters, even serving ourselves, he knew that's not freedom. They're, they're enslaved to some other master. I need to buy my people back. And so he did. But he buys them back to himself so we can become servants of him. And when we serve him, now we're fulfilling our purpose. Now we're doing what we're meant to be doing, and there's a deep satisfaction that comes from that. And so Paul goes on, and he fin I'll read the last part, the, these last verses here. He says, Therefore, so because of all this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is an, that's, this is an amazing thing about God. So God has a purpose for us. He wants us to fulfill the purpose, and we find deep satisfaction when we work on his purpose, when we fulfill his purpose. And the amazing thing about God is, uh, God's really, when we fulfill his purposes, when we serve him, it's really God the one doing it in us. God's the one working in us to even do these things. We want to, if we, if we go all the way back to the, the Garden of Eden, and what we were put on, on earth for, uh, God created, he put together all of creation, and then the last of all, he puts human beings on earth, and he says, I want you to be my representatives here in this creation. I want you to take care of it. Uh, he, ha he has a job for us. He, that's what we're created for. And this is what having a calling means. We've been created to do something. He says, okay, uh, be my representatives here. Act as I would act in my creation. This is our calling. But like I said, sin comes in and takes us captive. And we, we start to make messes of things and we get tangled up and we, we get our own ideas and our own ambitions and we start acting selfishly and we start living selfishly and we start having different masters and other masters and we start following ourselves. And Jesus has to come in. He has to break all the chains that bind us and buy us back to himself so that we can be free to serve him, so that we can be free to live out the calling that he prepared. Because, Paul says, you have a job to do. You have a job to do. You have a calling. You have a purpose. And you're going to find satisfaction when you're fulfilling that purpose. Here's the great thing, Paul says. He, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. So God has something he wants you to do, and he puts what he wants you to do on your heart to even do it. So sometimes we think, well, maybe God wants me to do something, but it's probably something miserable. God probably wants me to be miserable and do something very difficult. What really happens is God puts on our heart what he wants us to do so that we, as we follow him, we even start to desire to do what our purpose is. When we pray to God or when we ask God, we hope that God does great things. We say, God, I hope you, you fix this situation. I hope you do a miracle here. I hope you do something great. And God says, I'll do you one better. I'm going to do something great, and you're going to be the one who does it because I want you involved in this thing. I don't want you just sitting around and then I do all the work. I'm going to work in you and through you to do my will in creation. And when you really get that, when you really understand that it's God working in you to do it, it gets pretty exciting. When you think, God is using me in his world to do things. God has something for me to do, and he's going to do things in this world through me. That's a very exciting way of living. But this, uh, this understanding needs to be key, that we are doulos. We are bought servants of God. And this, I think this understanding helps us to know how we can do all things for God's glory. Because if we're servants of Jesus, and if we embrace that identity as servants of Jesus, then, then it's not like we're free to do our own thing uh, most of the time, and then every once in a while we do something for Jesus. It's, 
No, I just am a servant of Jesus. That's who I am. That's, that's my identity. So even when I'm reading a box of cereal, I'm reading a box of cereal as a servant of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't mind cereal. Like, you know, God created food. We, we think that, oh, there's just the, the big special things. Those are the things God wants us to do. But then we read the Bible and we find, well, what does God really want me to do? And it's stuff like uh, be a good father, be a good husband, you know, be a loving wife, do, you know, work peaceably with one another. It's like these little things that we think, yeah, we don't care about those little things. And God says, no, that's what I care about. I love those little things. And I want you to do those little things as my representatives, as my servants. And we find if we embrace this identity, that there's deep satisfaction in, in, in doing all things because we know that we're doing them, uh, that it's God working in us to even do these things. But we have to embrace this identity of this is who I am. I'm a servant of Jesus. That's who I am now. I'm not, I'm not a servant of anything else. I'm not a servant of my job anymore. I'm not a servant of my family anymore. I'm not a servant of my anxieties anymore. And now I'm a servant of Jesus. I serve a different master now. And when those old masters want to pull me away again, I remind myself I'm a servant of Jesus now. I, I, yes, they're still speaking to me, but I follow Jesus now. And this identity is something we, we carry around with us all the time. I have, uh, I have kids, and uh, sometimes I'll say this to my kids, and they get sick of me saying this. I, 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 I used to say this more than I do now because they got so sick of me saying this. Uh, but I would say to them, let's say they're going to school or going to, with the friends, or they're going out somewhere, you know, and you get a little worried, like, uh, how's my kid going to act, you know? Uh-oh. They're, you know, sometimes they can be little monsters, and now we're, you know, I hope they, I hope they act up right. And I would say to them, hey, okay, guys, as they're leaving, remember, you're a Gibbons, and that might not mean something to you, but it means something to me. Like, that's an important thing for me. And when you go out from this place, when you leave this car or the house or whatever, you're leaving the car with my name. You're leaving with the name of Gibbons. Be careful with it. Be, because it means something to me. My kids say, Dad, stop saying that. Uh, <laughs> but we are. It's, it's an identity that, that my kids carry with them. And as we go out, we have that same identity. Uh, we have an identity that Jesus gave us, and we need to be mindful of this. Oh, I'm bringing the name of Jesus with me where I go. Um, and it's not, it doesn't mean I always think about it 24-7, but it means what am I doing with it? How am I using it? Uh, I am a servant of Jesus. We need to realize that's first and foremost. Uh, if I truly understand that, if I tu truly embrace that, then I have to realize everything I do is for my Lord. Everything I do is for him. It's God who works in us, Paul says, to will and to act. This is amazing to me. Again, I got to go back to this because God puts, God puts things in our hearts and our minds. And so I guess I want to ask you, what is it that God has put on your heart and your mind? Maybe you've got some kind of, maybe you've got something you feel like you need to do or something you feel like would be good if someone else did. But we all have this, this want inside of us. Uh, and it's God who puts that want inside of us. It's God who puts that, that burning inside of us to do something so that we'll actually go out and do something. He wants us to be fulfilled. So he says, I'm going to give you this idea to do this thing. And then when you do that thing, guess what? That's God working in you both to will and to act according to his purpose. And we all have, we all should have this want. What's your want? What do you have inside of you? Some of us, the want has, has died a little bit because of the busyness of life and the difficulty of life. We're just trying to survive and we put the wants uh, in, our, in our closet somewhere. But there's a want in there somewhere and that's a good thing. Uh, God put that there. And as long as this want that you have, this desire, as long as it's not sinful, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying, yeah, whatever you want, go ahead and do. Well, no. But if you have a desire to do something, consider God may have put that there so that you would act on it. That's how God works. Because we are servants of God and he has a calling for us. He has a calling for you. And he's a good Lord. He's a great father. Uh, like Brian was saying, he sets everything up for us. We're slaves to some other master and God 
comes and he frees us and he strengthens us. And he not only uh, frees us for a new life, but he gives us the will to live out his life. And he even uh, works through us so as we act, we're doing his will. And then he praises us for it. So he gives us all these things. He says, I got a purpose for you. I'm going to give you the want to do the purpose. I'm going to give you the strength to do the purpose. I'm going to work in you to do the purpose. And then I'm going to praise you for doing it. And he's, he's going to say, when we reach him in heaven, well done, thou good and faithful do loss. That's the word there. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what the Bible says. I, I just love this idea that God has this uh, plan for us, this calling for us, and God is the one that's even doing it through us, and then he praises us for doing it. I remember teaching my kid uh, baseball. You know, you teach your kid baseball, and you start with, we started with a t-ball. You know, t-ball is this, you know, this the plastic stand, you put the ball on it. I remember my holding, you know, having my son come up, he's all excited, and I go out, and I set up the bases, I set up the t-ball, I set up the ball. I said, now here's the bat, and I give him the bat, and I stand beside him, and I said, this is what it's like, and I you know, I'm, I'm holding that bat behind him and I pull the bat back and then I, we swing together and I'm holding his hands and he hits the ball and it goes off this way and then he starts running the bases he's, he's excited. He's like, yeah, I'm great. And I'm looking at my son and I go, yeah, and I'm proud of my son and I love it. And I, but I'm the one who really did everything here. You know, I'm the one who set up everything. I feel like this is, this is how God works with us. He's got all these things that he wants done and he sets up everything. He's prepared everything in advance for us to do. And he sets up the t-ball, he sets up the ball, and he says, okay, come on, step up to the plate here. And he gives you the bat, and he's holding on to it, and he knocks the bat, the ball away, and we, we run the bases, and we celebrate, and God looks, and he says, that's my boy. That's my girl. I'm proud of you. And he cheers you on. And you run the bases, and you feel like an all-star because God's there, and he loves you, and he praises you. Don't we have a good God? Don't we have a good father that he would praise us for things that he has already set up and done? We have a great God that we serve. And, we have a, and when we are following that calling, there's a deep satisfaction that comes with that because he's the one who set up everything to do.